In this video, you're gonna learn how to generate random tiles all in code and learn all about arrays in the first programming language. Let's get started. First things first, let's go ahead and go to verse, verse explorer, and we are going to create lesson seven, create new verse file, lesson underscore zero seven. Open up our code. Now, an array is a list of things. That's all it is. It's just a list and it starts at zero. You're gonna use them all the time in programming and especially as a game program, and especially in UEFN. So let's just go ahead and dive right in to arrays. Let's imagine a game where whenever the player dies, we roast them, or when they make a mistake, we roast them. We show a UI on the screen just to kind of laugh them, make fun of them, you know. Those are the kind of games I like to play. So I'm gonna say roasts, colon, square braces, and then of type string equals array. Now you've worked with variables, variables and constants before. It's no different here. The only difference now is we put the square braces in front of the type to denote an array. And then we use the array keyword. And right here, we are initializing an empty array. Okay, an empty array. This is an empty constant that has nothing in it. So let's fix that now. Here in the array, we're gonna say, dude, you suck. And you call that a kill? Because even when they do something good, we're gonna you know, make fun of them. And then uh, my grandma has better hops than you. Okay, so we are, I'm gonna minimize this here. I'm gonna go to view word wrap. So what we're doing in this array is doing a string with the double quotes, comma in between the elements, and then just storing them within the curly braces. So this is a constant, okay? I can no longer change the values of this array. So that's pretty cool there. But what can we actually do with it? Well, imagine the game where we just wanna print one of the roasts to the screen or on the UI. So let's go ahead and say print roasts, square braces, zero, okay? In an array, you access elements by specifying the index that you want to grab from the array. This is very common in every programming language. And in fact, the syntax is most the same in every programming language. But we've got a squiggly, that terrible infamous squiggly. This invocation calls a function that has the decides effect which is not allowed. Okay, in other programming languages, you can do this. And what will happen is if your array has nothing in it, you will get an index out of bounds error, which could completely crash your program. So I've had a lot of programmers tell me they don't like burst. They don't like how you have to do crazy things and workarounds to work with arrays and stuff. But this is a very good thing. Verse is stopping us from doing dumb, dumb things like accessing elements that aren't there. We are forced to wrap this in what's called a failure context, okay? Forcing us to handle a potential error. So our game doesn't crash. That's great, thank you, Verse, thank you. Thank you, Tim Sweeney and whoever else invented this programming language. It's great, actually. So we can't do this, but that's fine. How do we work with our all right, how do we print an element inside of it? We simply wrap it in a failure context, okay? If random roast colon equals roasts zero. I'm just putting it in an if statement at this point, okay? Put a colon here. A random roast is my constant that I'm creating and we're using type inference here to say, hey, this is gonna be a string from this array, okay? Now what I can do is I can print random roast to the screen, okay? Which would print, dude, you suck, all right? Pretty cool. To show you that you can't access elements that aren't there, let's try accessing something that isn't there. So we're gonna say if third, well, let's say if, uh, yeah, we'll say third, fourth element, colon equals, and let's go ahead and say 
roasts. Well, the fourth element is technically number three, okay? Because remember, arrays always start at zero. Zero, one, two. So this index two is actually my third element. The fourth element, okay, that would technically be index three. So in our array, we've got zero, one, two. I don't have a third index because we have three items, not four. Remember, we start at zero, okay? So I would expect this never to print. So I'm gonna say, we're gonna say uh, this should not print. And we'll go ahead and say print third element, like so. And then, uh, or sorry, I meant to say fourth element. There we go, like so. So if I run this program, I should expect this to print, dude, you suck. And then I should expect nothing else to happen. So let's go ahead and see if this works. Back in our editor, verse, build verse code. And then you're gonna go to your creative devices and drag in lesson seven. And then go ahead and push changes and let's see what happens. Okay, it ran. It says, dude, you suck. And it printed nothing else. Uh, and that's because there was nothing else to print because it failed. So this code right here failed. In other programming languages, here's the thing, in other languages, this would have ran. If I had just done something like this right here, it would have ran and it possibly would have crashed the program, okay? Because you have to always handle those things, but it doesn't force you to handle those things. In verse, it does. So I think it's wonderful. It's a wonderful thing, okay? So that's how we can access elements in the array. Now, what if you wanted to access the last element in the array? Uh, and maybe you don't know how long it is. Maybe your array has 1,522 elements in it. How would you access the last item in the array? We say if last item colon equals roasts, and then this is where we typically put the index, right? So what I can do is I can say roasts dot length minus one, all right? And then we could print the last item, okay? So I'm accessing, I'm running an expression here, okay? Just some math. So roast dot length is, so what is the length of it? It's one, two, three. Our length is three. When you call the length property, it doesn't start at zero because it's just asking how long it is. So one, two, three. But obviously I don't wanna put the number three in here because it'll be out of bounds because we start at zero. So roasts.length minus one. If this is a little bit confusing, that's okay. Just know you're gonna to need to memorize this syntax, basically, this way of working in code. You typically get the length of an array and you minus by one to get the last element. We use that all the time in loops as well too. It's a very, very common thing to do. So that's how you grab the very last item. Now, what if you wanna change an element in the array. Well, you're used to doing something like this, right? Set roasts zero, you know, equals blah. Well, first off, this would have to be in a failure context, right? Because we don't even know if the array has any elements at all. But the problem with this is this roasts array is actually a constant. You cannot change, just like a variable, you can't change your array uh, with the set keyword, okay? Because it's a constant, it's unchanging. So you're used to doing that and it works the same here. So let's create, I'm gonna comment this out, control uh, forward slash. Let's create a new array variable this time called boasts, all right? Maybe we wanna show something on the screen that encourages the player. Who would wanna play a game like that? Uh, same thing, array. And this time, let's just add some different quotes in here. You are amazing, goat and king killer. All right, hooray for all that exciting, exciting boast stuff. Now, how can we actually change an element inside of this array? Well, it's the same thing as we were just attempting. So we say if set boasts zero to equal something new. Uh, what do we want to say? How about crushing it? Okay, like so. And there we go. So we're just setting the value in here to something else. 
Uh, if it succeeds, great. If it doesn't, then it'll fail. And that's another reason, again, I love verse, is I don't have to worry about handling the failure. Like, hey, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, nothing's gonna break on me, which is, which is really nice. I could easily have said, you know, 1,000, and it doesn't matter because uh, we have it inside of a failure context. What actually happens when it fails is it will unwrap the value that you're trying to store in there and just restore it to whatever it was. Everything in the verse programming language, okay, is a value. Every variable is a value. It's not like C++ and other languages where you have pointers and references where you're just kind of swapping the data that's pointed to a location. No, everything in verse is a value. It's why we replace things. We don't, we don't change the memory location. We just replace the data altogether. And everything in verse is also an expression, okay? It's why you can actually pass in code like if statements inside of a function parameter because everything is an expression. It expresses into a value. You don't see that under the hood completely, but just know that's how it works, okay? We don't just mutate things. We replace the value altogether, okay? Pretty cool stuff. So we just changed the data inside of an existing array, all right? Now, here's the question that you're probably wondering and that I get so many comments about. It's how do I add elements to an array, okay? How do I add elements to an array? And the answer is you can't. You can't do it, not in the verse programming language. Sure, in C Sharp, Maybe you just grab a list, right? And you just insert into the list or append, same thing in Swift, just append right into that array. We are not working with pointers and memory. It's not possible. We don't do that. In verse, what we do is we replace arrays with new arrays, okay? So you just have to change your thinking a little bit if you're already a programmer, okay? So for instance, you know, I would not say, uh, you know, boasts dot append, you know, and some new phrase like so. Okay, I wouldn't do that. I won't add it like this. You might do that in other languages. Instead, what we'll do is we'll say set boasts plus equals, the plus equals operator, take whatever's in boasts and add it to something else, okay? And we're gonna make a new array and let's add some elements like love it and you the man and shredding, okay? Three new elements in this array. I'm gonna add them or concatenate them, and then we're gonna put them here in the boast array, set it. We're gonna replace what's there with this new array. That is how you add elements to an array. And it's completely fine to even add just one. If you're going through a loop and you wanna add a bunch of things to a new array, this is how you do it. You just concatenate it every time and replace it. Just know that the existing array is not changing. It's not, its length is not getting bigger. You are creating a new array and replacing it every single time, okay? This is a security and safety measure. This is how the verse language is gonna support web 3.0 and blockchain and other things like that. This is great. I really, I really think it's a safe and good way to write code. So that's how you do it just like that, okay? You can also, if you, if you go into the verse.digest, you can see some of the functions of an array I can just search for a slice. So here are some things you can do with arrays. You can slice them. So let's say, you know, I just wanted to get an element out of an array or two elements and get a new array back. There's a bunch of different features here. Uh, you can insert, not append. Keep in mind, you're, you're inserting something at a certain index, okay? Um, same array and it may fail. You can remove an element. You can remove all elements. You can replace an element, okay? There are some built-in functions of these arrays that you can use. I find that I don't use them a whole lot because mostly what I do with arrays is use them to store data and then I need new arrays with different data sets. I don't usually need to manipulate a particular array. Those are utility functions just to make your life a little bit easier. But this is it right here. This is a majority of what you'll be doing to add data to an array or rather to replace your array with a new one. Okay, good stuff. If this is confusing, that's okay. This stuff takes time to learn, all right? How do we go through an array? An array? How do we loop through it? I'm gonna show you the easiest way first, okay? 
we're going to say for each word in boasts, colon, print, word. All right. We're using the for keyword. This is the for expression. You may have seen this before in one of the previous videos. I'm creating a variable here, but notice how there's no equals this time. Okay, this is using a for expression. And what's happening here is we're saying, given this word, or rather given this word for this list of words, go ahead and store the data on that iteration in this variable, okay? So it's gonna go through boasts, which at this point, let's see, has uh, one, two, three, it has four, five, six. It has six elements. So this is gonna run six times. It's gonna store the data in this word variable here, and we're gonna print it. This is the easiest way to go through an array, okay? You can also do this in a map, which is another data, a data structure you'll learn about later. Okay, that's the easiest way just to go through all of them. Sometimes though, you may need more than just the data itself. You may need to know the index or the order of the array that the item is in. Uh, we can also work with an index as well. So I can say for index colon equals, we do add the equals this time, okay? Because we're assigning, we're doing an assignment here, okay? We're not using the built-in for loop expression, we're doing an assignment here, between zero dot dot and roasts dot length minus one, okay? So colon. So what we're doing here is creating a new constant, and this is the range operator. A range operator allows you to put in two numbers and it can go in that range between those two numbers, okay? So we're saying, hey, between zero and roasts dot length minus one, so the entire array that we have. We're gonna go through that each time and it's gonna store that variable. Okay, it's not storing the element in this case, right? Because index is an int this time because we're doing a range. A range is an, an, gonna give us an integer. So it's gonna give us an index in these numbers here. So we know how long the array is, we're gonna go through it, it's gonna give us the index or an int, okay? Then what we can do is we can say if roast colon equals roasts index, then what we can do is we can say print, and then uh, we'll say roast inside the curly braces for inter string interpolation at index, index. Okay, so we're going through, it's the same, it's really the same thing here, except we've added a index on here to store that number so we can use the number to grab the element. So in this case here, we're gonna grab the element using the index. Now. Yeah, this is really kind of doing the same thing as before because we're not actually using the index for anything. But there's plenty of use cases in games where you want to know the order of something. And so when you put elements inside of an array, they're ordered. Whatever order you put them in is the order uh, that they're going to stay. And so if you need to know what order they're in, all you need to do is grab the index and you can use it like so, okay? And then of course we can grab the element at the index. Okay, that's another way to loop through an array. All right, so far I've just shown you the basics of working with arrays. However, the basics are what you're gonna use 99% of the time. So there's one more, little more complex thing that I wanna show you to really get you excited about working with arrays. And this is a multi-dimensional array. I know it sounds scary and it is kind of scary, but imagine all kinds of games like Battleship where there's grids, there's an X and a Y and you put your pins in. Or imagine all the games like Candy Crush, right? Where they come down in a grid and the candies fall. Those are all using multi-dimensional arrays, okay? Think of it as a grid, okay? Whenever you need a grid, use a multi-dimensional array. These are also used in mathematics in code when you wanna work with matrices, okay? And so multi-dimensional arrays basically allow us to store an array within an array, which is great for generating grids. So now what we're going to do 
is some actual gameplay where you can see the value of working with arrays as we generate random tiles at runtime. No more dragging in props. Like, what if we just want to generate a whole bunch of them right here on the fly in our code? What? In a grid. Let's do that. So, what I want to do is create a new method or function just to make our code a little bit easier. We are going to say generate tiles void equals. I'll put a block here to get rid of my squigglies. And all I want to do is create a grid of tiles that show up in the game randomly. So let's go ahead and make a multi-dimensional array to do this. I'm going to say var tile grid colon. Now you've seen these square braces before, but now we're going to do double square braces. That's a multi-dimensional array, or rather an array within an array. Okay. And this is going to be of type creative prop. Now I'm putting a question mark on here because when we create props at runtime, like when the game's running, it may fail. And so I need to be able to store uh, data that might not be there. Okay. So that's why we're putting the question mark there because it's optional or it could fail and provide nothing, which is false. Okay. And then we're going to say equals an array. And this time we're going to say another array. So what we're doing here is we're just putting an empty array within an empty array like so. Okay. Um, and we could also leave it like that as well too, but I'm showing this to you here, showing this to you here. So you know that this is a multidimensional array. And again, the question mark is an option type, which says, Hey, yes, it's a creative prop, but it's optional and it may not be there. Okay, we have to ha have that in advance because it can fail. I didn't write the code that can fail. Epic Games wrote the code that can fail. And you'll see why in just a minute. So here's our tile grid, double square braces, the type name, and we added the, we added the option type in front of it because I know we're going to need that, equals array, just like before. Okay, just like before. Now, let's go down to our generate tiles. So we want to kind of create elements for our, um, for our for loop. Okay. Or rather we want to create elements for our grid using a for loop or for expression. Okay. So let's do that. Now we're going to say set tile grid. So remember that multidimensional array we just created, we're going to set it. Now I'm going to, you're going to see maybe some new syntax where we do multi line uh, code here in this expression. And that's normal. Remember everything in verse is an expression. So even though I'm going to have multiple lines here, it's doing the same thing as before when you just create a single line assignment. I'm, it's no different than this here. Okay. So here we go. We're going to do a four expression for each row colon equals. And how many tiles do you think we want? I'm going to say 25. So think of a grid. Okay. If we want 25, we got to go five up and five horizontal. Okay. Five and five. That's going to make our grid of 25, 10 and 10 would make a hundred. Okay. So I'm going to say between if for each row and also with rows and columns, I want you to think of like an Excel spreadsheet. You've got columns at the top and rows on the side. Okay. So for each row between zero and five colon, and now we're going to do a second for loop for each column colon equals in zero dot dot five. Okay. So we're, it's going to happen. It's going to go through a for loop and then it's going to, once it gets here, it's going to go into another for loop. So it'll do this once and then it'll do this five times. One, two, three, four, five. Then it'll come back up here and it'll do this a second time. And then one, two, three, four, five. And then this a third time. And then one, two, three, four, five, right? Columns and rows. That's what's happening here. Okay. So we got our call. We're going through our rows. We're going through our columns. Now what I want to do is right here is where I want to create a tile, but we don't have the code for that just yet. Okay. We don't have the code for this. So what I need to do is comment this out for just a moment in unreal editor. We need to have some way to reference an asset. Okay. I'll put the block here. 
which we don't have in our game yet right now. So if you're wondering why would I show this code here and then comment it out and go back, because I am showing you how to code how a real programmer codes. We go as far as we can. We plan as best we can, but we go as far as we can. When we can't go any further, we do the next thing we need to do to solve the problem. In this case, we need an object, first off, that we can instantiate at runtime. So I'm going to say var tile asset of type creative prop asset. Now this is a special type created by Fortnite uh, that allows us to instantiate a prop at runtime. Colon equals default creative prop asset. That is a built-in uh, default type that we use when we want to create an asset. And what I also need to do on this is make it at editable so we can assign it inside of the editor. So let's go back to the editor, go to verse, build verse code, and see how there's a tile asset here now. What I'm gonna do is click it, and what I want you to do is pick a floor tile. I'm searching for floor tile. Pick any tile that you think looks really cool, and that's it, and save it, okay? That's it. Now, notice how you can't pick your own props on here. It's only pre-built props by Epic Games. And also, some props, like these floor tiles, they're considered part of a building, and if I try to move these using teleport and move to, they actually don't work because the settings are disabled. So only some of these props will let you, if you dynamically spawn them, only some of them will let you actually move them around later on. Okay, like, you know, the plush caterpillar or the cat, you can move those ones. Other ones like these floor tiles, you cannot move with code if you spawned them dynamically. So just so you know, uh, I spent many hours trying to get code to work just to come to find out that you can't. Uh, I talked with a staff member, you can't do that as of uh, 24 point. 10 in UEFN. So we've got our tile asset of creative prop asset. And all I want to do is basically make a grid. I want to make a tile, move it over, make a tile, move it over, make a tile, move it over. Okay. I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you the code that people write to create things like Candy Crush, Match 3 games, you know, Battleship. Here it is. And you'll be able to do it in the verse programming language. So it's confusing, but you'll get it eventually with lots of practice. So I've got my asset here. Now, I'm assigning right here my tile grid. I'm creating a multi-dimensional array. But I'm not ready for that yet because I have some spawning I gotta do. So I'm gonna make a new function here, okay? And I'm gonna call this create tile for index. And inside of these parentheses, the parameters, I'm gonna say the x index, idx, all right? I'm going to say the y index, i, d, x, like so. And I'm going to return a creative prop. And I'm putting the option type here because, remember, our array here is of the option type. And notice how I'm not returning a creative prop asset. That is only used when you are instantiating a prop at runtime. We want an actual prop to store. And then later, depending on the prop type, we could move it or do some things with it, and you'll see what we're gonna do with it shortly. So how do we create a prop at runtime? So what I'm going to do is I wanna create a tile and then have a spacer, create the next tile, have a spacer, create the next tile, and then it's gonna go up on the next row and do the same things. I want them spaced equally. So I'm gonna type in spacer colon equals 700.0. Okay, and I tested that number out to get the spacer that I wanted. You can play with yours as well too. Just know that if it's too close, your tiles are gonna look like they're not even apart, okay? So make sure that your spacer is big enough. Otherwise you might think there's a bug. So I'm gonna say if, we're gonna say x position colon equals float. I need to convert or cast some numbers here. So I'm gonna say idx times spacer so I'm gonna take my float spacer, multiply it by the index. This index is gonna come from our, our uh, loop here inside of our tile grid when we're creating the tile grid, okay? Uh, we just haven't got there yet. So I need to show, I need an X position of the tile and a Y position of the tile to move it where I want it to go, okay? 
So we've got an x position. Let's do comma y position, colon equals float, y i d x times spacer and colon. Okay? Now I've got my x position and y position. Why am I not doing the z position up and down? Because for right now, I'm just going to hard code a number in there. I don't want them all kinds of different heights. We'll keep it easy. Now what I need to do is actually spawn the prop. So I'm going to say return spawn prop. This is a built-in keyword. I'm going to type in tile asset. And then what I need now for the spawn prop, it's going to ask me for a position and it's going to ask me for a rotation. So what is the position? Well, the position is a vector three. Now I have not imported the spatial math, so let's do that now. I'm gonna go over here to this top Unreal Engine one, paste it, and instead of diagnostics, I'm gonna type in spatial math so I can get access to the vector three struct. All right, so I'm gonna say vector three, x colon equals x position, and then we'll say y colon equals y position, and then z colon equals 10.0. I just want to lift it off the ground a little bit, okay? Next, it's expecting a rotation. So I'm going to type in identity rotation parentheses. That's a built-in rotation uh, that's available to us. Uh, that's like a default rotation. Now, why is it giving me an error? Well, one reason is if this if statement fails, we're not returning anything at all. Um, so let's first off, let's fix that. We're going to say else return false. So whenever you use the option type, it may have nothing in it. Okay. It may be false. So if we don't actually return the creative prop, we have to return false saying that it failed. All right. That's why we have this here. Cause it could fail. The spawn prop could fail. Now, why is this one failing? And there's a reason for that. Control click spawn prop. If I look at this closely here, okay, I need to pass in my asset, okay, a position and a rotation, but look what it's giving me back. Let's go to view uh, word wrap, okay? I lost it. Spawn prop, there it is. Um, it's giving us back a tuple. Oh, see these parentheses here? This is a tuple, and we haven't covered tuples yet, but basically it's a data type that allows you to put multiple objects in it. So the first data that is coming in this is a creative prop. And the second one is the spawn prop result. If we wanted to know if it was successful or not, I can control click that. Okay, unknown error, invalid spawn point, spawn point out of bounds, invalid assets, too many props. So these are some errors and messages you might get back, okay? And look at this, currently 100 per script. So uh, if you could only generate 100 props per device, so you'd have to have multiple devices to generate multiple props. So there's some errors. We're not gonna worry about that right now. So since it's a tuple, and I know the tuple syntax, which I haven't showed you, but I'm showing you now, I can access the first element by doing parentheses zero, okay? That's gonna give me the creative prop that I just showed you inside of this, okay? That's what it's gonna give me. All right, times zero, and that's gonna send me back a creative prop, an optional creative prop, okay? That's what it's gonna give me, excellent. Um, one thing I did forget to do is here in my parameter, I forgot to put of type int and of type int. And my spelling is off right there. Okay. I know this is complicated. We're it's It only gets worse from here, ladies and gentlemen, but I'm going to guide you, okay? Uh, we did all the easy stuff first. So create a tile for index, all right? The index is the row and the column. If x position, so we're going to try casting the casting the the index of the row or column times the spacer. Okay, we need to move that tile over. Same with the y position. Multiply it by the spacer. Remember rows and columns. That's what these x index and y index are. And then we spawn the prop. You've seen the vector three before. You haven't seen the tuple, but because it gives us back a tuple, I know I could just access the element here. And to, just to show you, to make this a little more clear, I could say you know, um, spawn prop tuple, okay? And then what I could do is I could, you know, I could put this right here, equals, 
Actually, we'll just say colon equals, like so. So I've got this spawn, spawn prop tuple, and then what I could do here, just to make it clear for you, is I could say spawn prop tuple zero, okay? So that's what we got back, is we got a tuple, okay? Whenever you're confused about something not working, go look at the code and see what it's returning, okay? See how it says up here, tuple. That's what it's returning. Sometimes it's an int, sometimes it's something else. A tuple, and inside the tuple, there's two objects. It could have been three objects, five objects, 10 objects. It's giving us two objects, all right? And we're just accessing the first element, which is the creative prop, if it succeeded. If it failed, it will be false, and that will return false, all right? Are you with me so far? I know, it's painful, I know, but that's okay. Now, let's go back to our generate tiles. I'm gonna uncomment all of that right there. So here we go, four column. So we're going through rows and columns. Now, let's keep this really simple. We're gonna say create tile for index, row, and column, okay? So what we're doing here, this is confusing, I know, because you haven't seen this before, but here in the tile grid, we are running an expression. Remember, up here, we're also running an expression. We're creating an empty array. This is the same thing, or rather, we're doing a same type of operation, running an expression. You're just seeing a multi-line expression. And what you see right here, okay, create tile for index, what it's going to do is because in the verse programming language, everything expresses to a value. This would not work in other programming languages, okay? But in verse it does. This is gonna express a value, which is a creative prop, okay? So this tile grid, it's gonna run this expression until it's done, and magically, under the hood in this expression, it's going to create the multi-dimensional array with these creative props, okay? If I said the number, let's say the number 10 here, this is gonna fail because it's expecting a creative prop. Isn't that interesting? So this is expressing a value and it's trying to store it in this new array that it's creating, but it can't because it's an integer. But if it was an integer array, it would work, but it's not. It's a creative prop optional. And the, the option is, is very important on here because it could be false. So we have to make sure that our multidimensional array type is the same with the question mark on there, the option, okay? Okay, and in order to get this all to work, we simply need to call our generate tiles function. So here in on begin, generate tiles and save. Verse, build verse code, push verse changes. Hey, and look at that, look at all these beautiful tiles. Pretty cool, right? If your mind's exploding with ideas of the things you can do with this, it should be because there's a ton of things you could do with this. Imagine making your own Fortnite Candy Crush game. Ooh, that'd be interesting. All right, so that looks good. I'm gonna show you one more thing. And it's not gonna be easy, but it's very important. I'm gonna show you how to iterate through a multi-dimensional array. And I'm gonna show you with a real working example. So in my case here, what I'd like to do is after five seconds or so, I wanna get rid of some random tiles. Imagine a game where you're on the tiles, there's lava underneath you, and I wanna start disappearing some of those tiles. Well, I'm gonna show you how to do that. So, we're gonna say, remove random tiles. This is a new method here. Void equals. And what I need to do is I need to basically just go through all the rows and columns of the array. So the first thing I need to do is say, number of columns, I'm spelling this out long just so you can know what I'm doing, of type int equals tile grid zero dot length. Now, remember, you're used to accessing an array with the syntax here, but why are we saying tile grid zero dot length? Remember, there is an array inside of an array. So the first element basically inside of, of our array is another array, okay? It's a multi-dimensional array, rows and columns. Anytime you get confused, think of an Excel spreadsheet, rows and columns, rows and columns. So I need to get the first element here, the length of my columns. How many columns do I have in my Excel spreadsheet? How many columns, the ones on the top? Let's get the length of that, okay? Then for each row, colon equals, we're using the colon equals uh, constant uh, type inference here, 
um, because we're going to use a range between 0 and tilegrid.length minus 1. I told you you'd see that again. And column, colon equals 0 dot dot number of columns. So we need to get the, now we're on this particular row of this particular column. So one column, so remember in Excel, column A, right? Then you go row one, two, three, four. Let's say I have 10 elements, you know, in 10 rows. So column A would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and nine, 10. Then we gotta go to column B, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, just like an Excel spreadsheet. In fact, that's how I taught myself how to learn this when I was learning to code is I just thought of spreadsheets, okay? Then we're gonna say if tile colon equals, we're gonna grab a specific tile, row, and then column. Okay, look at this, same as index as before, the square braces. We're just doing it twice because we gotta go into the first element of the array and then the second one. If this is confusing to you, just remember that this is the syntax for multi-dimensional arrays. You will always access an element with the two, two sets of uh, square braces. Now, we need to put a question mark here because remember, it's going to give us an optional type. We can't use an optional type. We need, to, we need to use the real object itself. So we put the option at the end here to say, hey, try and get the value out of it. Try and actually get us a creative prop, okay? That's what the question mark's for. If we didn't, it would give us a creative prop optional, which we can't do anything with because it's optional. It could be false, all right? Now we're gonna say rand colon equals get random int between zero and one. I have not imported that in, so let's go over here and copy verse simulation, paste it, and we'll type in random. So what I wanna do is basically, uh, if, it's a ran if it's a one or a zero, just remove the tile. We're just gonna get rid of some random tiles. That's all, that's all we're doing. And I'm gonna use a little random code to do that. So what we did right here is just iterating through the multidimensional array. Now I'm writing the logic, the thing I wanna do now that I'm in here. So I'm gonna say if rand equals zero, tile.dispose. So it's gonna give me a random number. Sometimes it'll be multiple times in a row. Sometimes it'll skip some. It's completely random. That's exactly what I want. Uh, if it's a zero, great. Now, if I wanted to delete less tiles, I could make the range bigger, okay? Um, but zero and one. I'm gonna go to tile.dispose, control click dispose, and that's part of our creative prop, okay? We can dispose it. Now, I wanna show you, if I got rid of that question mark, tile.dispose doesn't work because look how it has the question mark on here. There's no member uh, dispose in creative prop question mark. It's because it's an optional. Okay, I told you this, it's an optional. We can't do anything with the optionals except see whether they exist or not. By putting the question mark here, it's basically unwrapping the value. It's giving us the thing we can actually use. And if it can't, if it was false, this would all fail. All right, so memorize that syntax too. And save. So what I wanna do now is really just generate the tiles, wait for five seconds, and then I want to remove random tiles, like so. All right, I'm gonna go to verse, build verse code, push verse changes. All right, five seconds, let's see. How cool is that? If your brain juices are flowing again, they should be because we just got rid of tiles and now the game's much harder. Imagine all the math that you could do in your code to make this even more crazy without ever even having to drag a tile on the screen. That is the power of code. Tell those creative 1.0 developers to do something like this and they can't because you can only do it with code. I'm just kidding, no harm on them. Uh, but there is a lot of power that comes with writing code. And there's a bajillion algorithms out there with math and game theory, which you can just get and plop in here. And all of a sudden you've got some really dynamic stuff. So awesome things here. The last thing I wanna do is give you your assignment, okay? So we're gonna go down here, exercise. Step one, write code that uses two creative prop assets. We only used one. Then run an expression to alternate each tile. 
If I had a red and a blue tile, it would go red, blue, red, blue, red, blue. So you're gonna do the same thing we just did here, except with two, and you're gonna alternate which prop you create. And I don't care if it's a tile, it could be caterpillar, you know, cat, caterpillar, cat, whatever. Secondly, create a new multi-dimensional array uh, through spawning wall props. We just spawned some floor props. Make it a seven by seven array, and the wall props should stack perfectly without any spacing to make a giant wall. So I want you to figure out how big your tile is. You know, you can move it over in the editor to get the exact X position or Y position you need to move it. And then in your code, you're gonna basically create a giant wall with no spacing. I should not be able to see behind it, okay? That's what I want you to do for step two, all right? This is complicated stuff you did today. If you got here and you're still alive, congratulations. There's way more to come. This is building blocks of the verse programming language. Very, very important stuff. And there's a lot more to come, so see you next time. If you didn't know, my name is Mark Walbeck, and you can watch the next video in this series right here. And don't forget to subscribe and click the bell so you can know when the next videos are released.